Welcome to the new video in the Kanban series. This time I decided to answer the question to those who keep wondering how to build timelines and how to work with roadmaps in Kanban. And it's coming from the point where it's a million dollar question actually, because once people, once people start deciding they want to try Kanban or when they already started trying Kanban, they end up with a bit of, you know, concerns. But previously we were able to define timelines and agree those timelines with our customers or stakeholders. Our sales were relying on those timeframes to manage user expectations. How do we do that in Kanban? Very valid concerns, very valid questions, and they do tend to be asked quite often. That's why I think it's one of the most important topics to be answered. I don't have a silver bullet. Everything depends a lot on how you work, what's your team seniority, how experienced you are, and what kind of challenges can you start tackling. Less experienced teams will need to start further away and they need to build the context, build the process and maturity of it. More experienced teams can start faster and closer to the moment where you will be already able to answer the que those raised questions still while working with Kanban. I called it like si seven steps to epiphany because it's like once you see it, it just hits and, and it clicks in your head. But until then, it might seem like really doubtful shrouded idea or concept and you might not see the path to it because it's just so steep to get there that's why i have these seven steps and uh, it's based on my personal experience it's based on kanban best practices so i'll try to compile something which kind of worked for our team i saw it working in other teams and i added a bit of sprinkles for the success from my own perspective take everything with a fine grain of salt but may it, this, the goal of this video is to explain, show examples, and trigger your mind. That's it, right? Simple. So let's start. And usually, I start from the actual flow, or workflow, as majority of people call it. And when we're speaking about the process, it's all about value creation. I do hope it's about value creation, right? And that part, when you create value, can be complex and in that part you might have more stages than you actually think there is. First, a good example of how to improve that situation is to structure your workflow by splitting into two essential pieces. One, for figuring stuff out, which I called here pre-work, and then the actual work part where you are doing it. Figuring out and doing it split into two different pieces that's useful because this way you will have a far better control on quality priorities and understanding what needs to be done next and how to reach understanding of what needs to be done next while in the actual work part you will just focus on committing to something and finishing it this is so important we should commit or we should pull in items that are quality defined, specified, they have resolved dependencies, and it is completely clear how we will get to the finish line. This is very important because if you pull items that are not ready, if you pull items that have unsolved dependencies, they will just clog your process. They will stay in progress. They will allow to, to pile up the queue in some specific process stage and it's gonna be a waste. So we don't want to waste stuff. It's all about doing everything as lean as possible. Now, if you're already good with your structure, you have pre-work sorted out. Usually that's about two Kanban boards. You can, you can use one for the you know refinement and the other one for the actual work in progress. Then I recommend implement queuing. And by queuing, it's not just like drawing a queue, a line of work items, it's about talking with the team and understanding, first of all, what's the direction of the queue and how the priorities are maintained in the queue. And the word itself, queue, you shouldn't be jumping the queue. 
you should keep queuing and follow the queue. That is rule number one in Kanban. Topmost and rightmost items are most important and closest to the finish line. And then the rest need to fo needs to follow. And you shouldn't be adding new shiny objects. You shouldn't be attracted to new work because it's just new work. It should be placed in the queue and you know it should follow its priorities. If it's really, really important, if it's a burning need, maybe there is a critical issue happening right now and you need to solve it because everybody's, you know, going nuts. Your customers aren't able, you know, to function or perform the businesses without the solution to this uh, issue. You should consider having swim lanes or just more queues, right? One swim lane represents a single queue and that single queue focuses on specific work item type. It's just way to group similar things together. Because if we have expedite work, which consists of like critical issues, um, something that needs to be dealt urgently, because otherwise, if you don't do that, there will be, you know, financial risk, uh, business risk, or any other, you know, consequences that are really, really um, not good for your yourself and your customers. So these are like the most important types of uh, work items. It should be limited though as well. Don't push too many things in there because it's so tempting to use that queue and abuse it for any type of work saying, oh, I just want it to be done here and now. This is not okay. You need to have clear policies. What type of work and what kind of acceptance criteria you have so it can appear in the specific queue. Usually it's kind of two or three queues or swim lanes that get gets you going, like expedite for issues, fix deadline. Um, that one is important because we should be aware if among regular work, we have work that has deadlines. So it cannot fall into the same queue together with other items because it means we don't have full control on hitting the deadline. This is, this is risky. It can work if you have flexibility, but it can be risky if there was this question, but how our engineering team agrees with sales on deadlines. So that, that's one way to do that and keep the deadlines. And then there is the rest of regular work. So three simple swim lanes to represent the queues. And then inside each queue, items should follow the order. No jumping. Remember that. If you still see jumping, uh, each item jumping ahead of each other one, just try to, you know, um, implement additional queues, but don't, don't go too many, don't do too many of them, right? Because it can be, become tedious, too many queues, too many different types of work makes process complicated. And we don't want that. We want things simple because if it's simple, everybody will use it. Then the fourth step is once you have idea of what needs to be done and when you start working on how it needs to be done you should ensure certain level of quality so once people pull that work item into their working queues or work or, or delivery boards they must have all the necessary information they need to have they, they need to have all the dependencies resolved so once they commit it has a very high chance of success to being finished and delivered. This is very important. And there are certain things that are, you know, resembling quality of each work item. If it has constraints, they need to be evident and obvious and visible on the work item. If it has a, it should have a goal, not if, it should have clear goal what we're trying to achieve here. And, and it should have a writing why that is important. I know I myself miss this, and it's just a good practice. So writing why it's important can help to keep the same knowledge always traveling with the item. This is, this is very useful in the later stages. Then if it's a bigger, bigger effort, bigger piece of work, you must break down it in smaller pieces. This is just help, just helps your mind and your approach to doing that work, to reduce risk, to think how it will be done more precisely, and then maybe even spread the smaller pieces across multiple team members. But that's up to you. It's up how the, the way up to your way of working. 
then of course at least someone needs to be responsible one person is the golden rule because if there are more than one person nobody's responsible so at, well there needs to be an owner right of, of the actual work and then if it has documentation examples specification this must be also um, in as close as possible to the actual work item so yeah just ensure certain quality bar is met and if you keep doing that you will be pulling more items that just get finished successfully and faster you will be you will be able to prove that if you do this change and you have already and you've been already measuring how fast you can deliver something so you will see the positive change i have no doubt in that fifth step surprise measurement of course we need to measure because that's the only way to understand how much time it takes for us to complete work it can be related to average time for work to be completed it can be related to throughput how many items or tasks we complete over a certain amount of time a month a week again up to you and your business needs but that is like the precision point if we measure throughput per month this will be our precision measure precision because we will be forecasting in months if that's not enough and you need weeks then you need to measure throughput per week and then you will use that time frame as a precision point to say okay we forecast that this bunch of items can be done in upcoming two or three weeks it could be like that this could be your you know communication pattern with either internal or external stakeholders but it's forecasting it's not agreeing on something fixed and then stressing about not hitting the deadlines because the deadline is not the value itself usually it's the outcome that's valuable so once you're getting closer to the deadline but you see that something has been figured out during the process it happens what so do you still do the initial solution which might be already flawed or you spend extra time to make a better one you know you can always ask your end users customers stakeholders what they want do they want a deadline to be met or do they want an outcome and yeah it's it's then you know it's up to you what they choose and how to act i hope it's the outcome and though um and then once you have those measurements and you measure both steps of the flow the pre-work and actual work you will start getting an understanding how much time it takes for specific type of work to be done for specific batches of work to be done and this will be your main tool to align with other stakeholders to give us to give forecasts and get the knowledge which we raised as questions before when when is the thing gonna be finished when do we expect to do something you will take your items which are not yet started you will apply queuing then you will see that <clears throat> each batch of throughput is in your queue so in next month you will do first 10 items in another month second uh, second uh, dozen of items and that that's how you can do it there are other ways there are Monte Carlo simulations you can even do individual item forecasting and this is really the right stressless way to look at things and timelines instead of just you know agreeing on some estimated scientifically or subjectively dates and then stressing about them I know there are a lot of projects where deadlines are necessary and they are points of agreement but you can still work with that deadline is also not precise same way your forecast can be not as precise as somebody would wish but that's reality and then <clears throat> once you have everything once you have your measurements once you have your structure you should keep retrospecting you, you should keep looking at your flow and thinking whether it is efficient enough is it being blocked at some particular stage do we spend more time than we anticipated are we piling up unfinished work and with all these questions you can elect additional future improvements this is this th this is the key progress engine in any team 
sit down, relax, look back and think what can be done better. After doing this continuously month for month, year over year, you will achieve significant improvements. Not 10%, hundreds of percent. You just need to be persistent and you need to stick to your further looking vision of what is process management, what is, what is the, what, how do we approach improvements. So that, th these are my like seven steps, again, specific. You might do them in different order. You might skip one or two. It really depends on how you work and what kind of goals you have together with your team. If you like this guide, you can learn more in our videos or our social channels or blog. There are plenty of great content about getting great at Kanban. So see you in other videos. Hope you enjoyed this one.